I would like to believe that there are a fair few of you out there that at least vaguely remember Darkness Falls, a generic slice of heavily panned early 2000s supernatural Hollywood schlock that had a surprisingly good run at the box office before disappearing into the shadows of obscurity. It's one of those forgotten films of the era that's probably living dormant in the back of your mind from your younger years, and once you see the poster, a vague recollection might start coming back to you. Well, at least that's what happened to me. I've seen Darkness Falls a fair few times throughout my life, but I don't remember having any fond memories of it aside from the obvious supernatural threat that honestly serves as its sole defining feature. I'm not making this video because I think Darkness Falls is a guilty pleasure or underrated, I mean a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes is a little cruel, but when I think about it, this is going to be one of those films where I'll begin by defending it before coming to the slow, painful realisation that yeah, that score might even be a little generous. Look, I don't like reviewing bad films, instead what I'd rather do is explore the overlooked potential behind Darkness Falls because it has a really cool concept that suffers from an execution that is so disinterested in its own premise that I feel genuinely infuriated as to why Hollywood even bothered trying to be original in the first place. In fact, its first time director Jonathan Lebesman apparently had no interest in horror and did the movie purely as a career move to obtain clout in Hollywood to have more creative control over dramatic productions, which eventually landed him many acclaimed hits like Texas Chainsaw The Beginning, Battle Los Angeles, Wrath of the Titans, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hell, just to add fart to the flame, Darkness Falls has the 85 minute runtime with 10 of those minutes being credits in order to make the film an appropriate theatrical length. Yeah, Darkness Falls was truly the epitome of a soulless early 2000s cash grab looking to bank on the most basic tick boxes of the supernatural trend that was rampant in popularity at the time. And the annoying thing is, it worked in the same way a cheap Blumhouse flick comes and goes after making its budget back in its opening weekend. It's harmless to its target audience, but as a horror fan, can we please stop doing the bare minimum with genuinely decent ideas? Granted, I should have expected as much considering Darkness Falls released in the infamous January dump month had a relatively uninspired poster and had two taglines that screamed both, that'll do, and watch me make everyone shrivel up into a ball of cringe. An eye for an eye, your life for a tooth, oh, I, I, I think I have some whiskey left for my leprechaun video. Anyway, Darkness Falls is like if Stephen King wrote a Guillermo del Toro fanfic during his cocaine years. It's a contemporary take on old school fairy tales told in a swift moving stream of consciousness with a strong central antagonist, alluding to a vague childhood allegory that's never dwelled upon. It tells the story of Kyle Walsh, an emotionally disturbed, PTSD-stricken man tormented by his fear of the dark due to a sinister spirit known as Matilda Dixon, who lurks in the shadows of the night and kills anyone who stares directly at her. As a child, Kyle witnessed his mother be viciously killed by said fairy, but was confined to a psychiatric hospital for the remainder of his childhood for being suspected of murdering his mother. In the present day, living in Vegas under the gloom of constant light, Kyle is contacted by his childhood friend Caitlin, whose younger brother Michael is experiencing the same disturbing visions and violent behaviour identical to Kyle, encouraging him to return to the town of Darkness Falls to help Caitlin and Michael while living literally battling his own personal demon. Just from that synopsis, there's a fair bit to unpack that should make for a really fascinating look at our fear of the dark, repression and mental illness, especially amongst children, and the effects it has on them later in life through the dichotomy of adult Kyle and young Michael. Kyle is a depressed and paranoid recluse whose only real help is through heavy medication, while Caitlin's brother Michael is seen to apparently self-harm and display distressing suicidal tendencies, with the doctor's only efforts to treat him being the same ones supposedly used on Kyle, yet clearly they don't work and possibly made his mental state far worse as a result. You put me in the dark, so get me. Yeah, like there's some really heavy sixth sense level mortality shit in here. 
However, the problem is that this film has no interest in exploring any of this. I'm not saying it has to to make a good film, I would absolutely settle on a cheeky wee ghost event akin to The Fog, but at the same time, with the right nuance and passion for the premise, there was nothing to stop Darkness Falls from having a similar emotional potential as the work of Stephen King or Guillermo del Toro, or even more recent examples like The Babadook. Now, there is a particular component within this bundle of ideas that I do want to explore, but I'm going to leave it for the spoiler section of the video, so for now, I want to talk about the one thing I feel the film gets absolutely right, and that's the Tooth Fairy herself. When you consider how today's mainstream culture perceives the Tooth Fairy as Dwayne Johnson with a pair of wings, it's difficult not to look at the premise as silly, but I gotta say, Matilda Dixon can seriously piss off up the apple tree because she is legitimately menacing at times. The whole idea is that she can only travel in darkness because she's weak to light, but it's the pre-dementor floatiness and her faceless mask that give her a distinct chilling presence. While Le Beesman depends very heavily on lazy jump scares and doesn't have much of an eye for atmosphere, the visual presentation of the Tooth Fairy really kneels that creepy children's storybook look. It's like a moving shadow or a manifestation you see in the corner of your room when the lights are out, she is a complete trick on your imagination and absolutely exemplifies what comes to mind when I think of the obscurities that scared me as a kid. Hey, sorry to pause the video, but I'm in the middle of editing this and I just discovered that the Del Toro comparison is now validated because apparently that's what they were originally going for as Doug Jones was meant to play the Tooth Fairy in this pre-Pan's Labyrinth-esque design, which makes me think that this movie had an entirely different vision to what I just watched. But I can't say I'm against the more simplified design they settled on. Anyway, back to it. The most impressive shot happens in the opening, where Kyle hides in a brightly lit bathroom after his mother is murdered, and the camera tracks to reveal the Tooth Fairy lurking above the doorway, waiting for young Kyle to step into the shadows. I love the starkness of it, it's just a profoundly creepy image that portrays how a child manifests their abstract fear of the dark, and later appears in Michael's hellish view of the darkness as well. In fact, the film makes constant references to both Kyle and Michael suffering from acute night terrors, so in a way, the Tooth Fairy is basically some sleep paralysis monster that the doctors tried to cure with antidepressants. Although for clarity, I've never experienced night terrors or sleep paralysis, so I'm curious if there's anyone out there in the comments who might be able to shed some insight onto this interpretation as an effective representation of it. Now, the myth of the evil tooth fairy has been around forever, but the problem with today's presentation of the fairy is that it's become synonymous with Disney's sweet and charming happily ever after approach, which is actually misconstrued with pixies, which are historically linked to positive folklore because they have a genuine fondness for humans. But like I said in my video on the Hallow, notoriously fairies are arseholes. As long as you don't piss them off, they'll leave you alone unless you have something they really want. In various interpretations, fairies are vicious wee fuckers, and funnily enough, Guillermo del Toro is actually one of the only filmmakers to have represented them as authentically as possible, having used tooth fairies in multiple projects including Hellboy 2 and Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, which along with the Hallow present fairies as creatures weak to light similar to Darkness Falls. However, here's the thing. Technically, Matilda Dixon is not a Tooth Fairy in the mythological sense, which kind of ruins the concept in some capacity. The Tooth Fairy was just a nickname she obtained for giving children a gold coin after they lost their last baby tooth, and it plays no other feature to the plot, despite it being such a specific detail that should feel relevant. I suppose it is the catalyst to Kyle's trauma because he loses his tooth and the fairy arrives, but if her appearance is triggered by kids losing their last tooth, then why is she so relentlessly obsessed with targeting random people simply because they see her? The backstory the film opens with establishes Matilda Dixon as a beloved local to the Children of Darkness Falls who was disfigured in a house fire and left sensitive to light. 
Eventually, she was falsely blamed for the disappearance of two children and hanged for being a witch, only for the missing children to be found unharmed and so the town buried its secret and ever since she's haunted the town, killing anyone who looks directly at her. I'll admit that last part gives me a bit of whiplash because it really is an out of nowhere plot point, but I kinda see where it's going with it even if the execution makes it appear as random. So, it's sort of like a reverse weeping angel except once you see it, there's no going back. My theory is that it was meant to further play into the childhood superstition of hiding under your bed covers when you're scared, hence the theme of night terrors and using a flashlight to scare away the demons, so to speak. But this got me thinking that the film might have worked better focusing on child characters rather than adults and taking more influence from, well, Stephen King and Del Toro. Think about it this way, when you consider the premise of a tooth fairy collecting a child's last baby tooth, it puts across this whole subtext of growing up and offering a relic of your childhood to appease an evil spirit that's cursed to time because of the adult's wrongful killing of Matilda. It feels like we should be getting a Nightmare on Elm Street concept where the wickedness of the adults leads to a punishment placed upon their children, but instead what we get is Matilda only appearing to either Kyle or Michael as if there is literally nobody else she has to deal with. In fact, there's no mention of Michael even losing his last baby tooth, it just opens with him already having seen her and that's it, so the tooth angle is redundant once you get past how Kyle saw her. It goes back to this feeling I have that the filmmakers noticeably lack interest in the story. It looks like a one draft script where nobody really took the time to think about how all these pieces connect. It's pretty much the final act of a ghost story stretched over a runtime that's barely at theatrical length already. The fact that it's called Darkness Falls, yet makes zero use of the setting, is a depressing missed opportunity. There's no sense that Matilda has any fear or control over this town, as most of her appearances feel inconsequential. It makes sense in a ghost story like Dead Silence because our protagonist returns to a somber purgatorial ghost town, whereas outside its dramatic name, Darkness Falls is a hollow, lifeless setting despite being a genuinely beautiful looking coastal town suffering from a curse. Again, very much like Stephen King's use of Mian or John Carpenter's The Fog. However, as the film went along, I began to suspect that Matilda Dixon's inconsequential presence might have been a deliberate way to gravitate towards a plot twist that never happens. But to get to that involves spoilers, so go watch it. Or don't, I haven't exactly given it a stellar recommendation, have I? Okay, so I'm not the only one who thought Kyle would be revealed as the killer, right? I just naturally assumed it was going in that direction, less so because of how much it alludes to it and provides a lot of misdirection, but because plot twists were pretty popular in horror movies at the time, and many Hollywood movies in general were, uh, not too kind to the concept of mental illness, and we ended up with countless misrepresentations that stigmatized psychological issues. So there's this other great moment where Kyle and a childhood friend Larry, who is done dirty by everyone in the film despite being the most likeable character, are sitting in a bar and Kyle begins to have paranoid visions of Matilda. He eventually gets into a fight with a drunk guy in the woods who is then killed by the spirit and is arrested on suspicion of murder. Now this is the second time Kyle has encountered the tooth fairy and has emerged as the sole survivor, and with the addition of psychiatric medication, the cops are pretty quick to point fingers. In fact when Larry later dies, would you believe it, Kyle is the only other person around. It seems like it's very much alluding to him being the killer and Matilda was just some delusion to pass on the blame. And to be honest, I wouldn't be entirely against that idea if separated from how problematic it would have been perceived in relation to its portrayal of mental illness. What knocks down the theory immediately however is that we know Michael is experiencing identical visions and thus it's not an isolated incident. What it then devolves into is the film realising that it needs to increase the body count, so we have a shootout in the police station, followed by Kyle leading Michael, Caitlin and several soon-to-be corpses out of the hospital. We then have a climax for the sake of a climax where the survivors head to the local lighthouse to reactivate the town's power and have Kyle finally destroy the evil of Matilda Dixon once and for all. <sighs> I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really know where to go with this. 
Fundamentally, the problem is that Darkness Falls just doesn't have a story to tell. It's a plot that follows really shallow beats without any emotional journey for both the characters and audience. To be fair, this anticlimactic feel was pretty standard in a lot of 80s supernatural horror. I mean, The Fog, which I can't stop comparing it to, ends just as abruptly. But the difference is that The Fog has a spooky charm and framed around a campfire story to give it a mysterious, superstitious feel. I think the best way to summarise my feelings for Darkness Falls is that it's just a stilted horror. There is unquestionably a good nightmarish concept in here, and it does establish some fascinating character conflicts, but just refuses to do anything with them. There are many of you out there that will unironically embrace it and all the power to you, yet for me personally, Darkness Falls is a film that has this glimmer of nostalgia for being one of my early experiences with adult horror that left me truly disappointed. It's compelling more so for what it could have been, rather than what it is.